Okay, sir. Uh, District Operations Committee for the 18th. Can I get a roll call? Director Bragman. Here. Director Gibson. Here. Um, Director Kohler. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I see you. <laughs> and uh, Vice Chair Schmidt. Here. And Chair Russell. Here. Okay, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Vice Chair Schmidt. Aye. And Chair Russell. Aye. Thank you. Okay, public, any items not on the agenda? There are no comments. Thank you. Okay. okay. I need a motion to approve the minutes. Move approval of the minutes. Second. Roll call, please. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Vice Chair Schmidt. Aye. And Chair Russell. Aye. Okay, item two, watershed recreation management plan contract approval. Yeah, good morning, Director. Sean Horn, watershed resource manager. I'm joined with Michael Jones from Alta Planning. Um, <clears throat> this item is our watershed recreation planning contract approval. The staff recommendation is for the committee to review and refer to a future regular um, board meeting for full approval. You'll recall that in um, May of this year, we initiated an initial scoping process where we partnered with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy to get early input from stakeholders regarding the recreation managing, management planning process. Um, on May 21st, we had um, facilitated our first stakeholder input um, scoping meeting in which we had recreation planning professionals come and give presentations to give some foundational concepts and language around the recreation management planning process. And then on June 25th, we had our second meeting where we facilitated stakeholder breakout sessions to get early input from stakeholder groups about what they would like to see um, built into a recreation management planning process. In total, we outreached to about 57 community groups and we had participation from about 227 um, individuals in that planning process. Some of the overarching themes that we heard from our community members were that they wanted to see a data-driven planning process. They wanted to see ongoing public engagement um, throughout the entire process in different formats. They wanted us to think about how we balance conservation and biodiversity protection with recreation and think about visitor management strategies to spread users out across the landscape. Um, and also some stewardship and um, outreach principles that could be built in to the plan to help us protect the resources we value and the water quality that we protect. So out of that um, initial scoping phase, we developed a request for proposals. We sent it out to local planning firms with expertise in recreation management planning. Um, staff selected Alta Planning as um, the team to move forward with. They've partnered with ESA, as well as a professor from Oregon State who focuses on recreation ecology. Um, the scope of work really focuses on a project management component, a literature review where they'll look at our existing management plans and policies related to other water districts that are managing watershed lands and how they're doing it, as well as uh, to see what else we can bring in to give us some foundational concepts. And then the, the crux of the watershed recreation management plan will be built around a community engagement strategy. It'll include a visitor use census survey. So updating the 2013 survey that we did with some additional um, <clears throat> data sources that we now have access to. And then a review and development of some additional stewardship and outreach strategies as well as visitor management strategies. And then an assessment of our recreational facilities as well as development of management actions that can help inform um, and improve our operations of the, of the watershed. And then finally, we'll have an adaptive management component of that plan as well to make this a living document that gets updated from time to time. So the total contract amount is $266,000. We intend this to occur over the next 18 months or so, but we've built the contract to be about two years to provide some flexibility. Um, and that's kind of the review and Michael and I will take any questions, but really I think the, the big thing we want community members to understand is that this is a planning process that really is taking a holistic look at the watershed and all the different visitors and their unique um, goals that they're after when they're coming to the watershed and thinking about those comprehensively and not trying to solve just one issue at a time. So with that, we'll take any questions that you might have, but again, 
the recommendation and staff request is for referral to a um, future board meeting for approval. Okay, I, I have just a couple of comments if I can. Um, uh, the one, it, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very good idea, but if not carefully done, it could be a very bad idea. Uh, and uh, the reason I say that when we were going through the one TAM partnership process, uh, one of the concerns, and I've said this many times, so I apologize for having to say it again, but uh, we have to make sure we don't set the measurement of success for our recreational activities as number of people that come up to the watershed, number of visitors. I mean, there, that's uh, you see that sort of knee-jerk reaction that a lot of recreation managers want to do is how many people, that's the sign of success. So, um, and if we do that, it, this, this is a very bad idea now. I think everybody's got that message and I'm not really worried about that happening. Uh, the second point I have is uh, a, a procedural one. Um, we have a lot of people who attend the watershed committee meeting and would never even look at what's on a dock committee and not attend. So that whole group of people are not here today uh, and they're stakeholders. I mean, and I know we've had an involvement uh, in, in extreme, so that's, that's all good, but nevertheless, uh, this kind of a meeting would be more appropriate and, and more successful, quite frankly, um, at a watershed committee with our regular constituents that show up at that committee all the time. So, uh, and I understand from here, it goes to the board, not necessarily back to the watershed committee. Is that correct? Well, I'll, I'll just add that um, our intention here is to get the contract set up. And then at the watershed committee in March 17th, we would be bringing back a more detailed item for this that would review the schedule, the scope of the contract, and all the different ways that the community members can stay engaged in the process. Okay, good, thank you. I just wanna agree with Jack on both items, um, I, but and it does just to build on his first point, I think um, one thing to really um, work on in the scope, Sean, is going to be what are those performance metrics? It's fine to say what they shouldn't be, and I agree with Jack, but um, I think having clear performance metrics for the um, for the district, for the board, and for the public is going to be very important. And I, I had the same thought about the watershed um, committee, so I'm I'm glad to hear that. So it's not, just to confirm. So it sounds like there will be a watershed committee meeting on this before the scope is finalized. Is that correct? So the initial scoping phase was the way that we outreached all the community members to get their input for the scope of work. And that was the intention to get their input before we even did the request for proposals, which we did through two public meetings. Now we're trying to set the contract up and get it established so that at the March 17th meeting, we can really start to inform visitors and community members about the way we're going to kick this project off and when the next opportunity for an actual um, stakeholder engagement meeting will be. So the intention is that they'll have input. The scope of work is flexible and meant to be something that we can continue to revise and expand. And we were um, thoughtful in how we developed that, recognizing there will continue to be input from the community on how we move forward with this. Okay, that sounds great. Any other questions? Just um, uh, kind of a technical question. Is, is this like going through a CEQA type process? or is this sort of uh, another type of document that we're doing? Yeah, good question. So this is intended to be a guiding document. So a, a plan that we developed that gives us some operational procedures, but really links to our existing trails and management plan, which has CEQA coverage. And then as part of our planning effort and the role that ESA has in this project is they'll do an analysis of the plan to look at what is already covered under existing documents that we have or existing CEQA documents and what would be new and have to go through in more detailed environmental review, if anything. Okay. Okay, and then so it'll come back on March 17th to Watershed. That's correct. Is the plan. Yeah, I, uh, that was a good point, I think, by Jack. You know, that is, that's our yeah. kind of our core group of uh, Watershed folks. So that, that's good, it's coming back that early. So we're gonna have a leprechaun bring it to us on the 17th? Maybe. Um, okay. I, I'll, just, I'll just say that I agree with um, all the comments of the other board members here and, and just also highlight that, uh, that uh, in previous discussions about this effort, we have really highlighted the significance of needing to address um, bicycle access issues and, and e-bikes, a, a longstanding issue 
of concern for a lot of folks. And it's not the only issue by any means. And so I'm, I'm going to be really looking to see in our in the refinement of the scope of work about how to address that that complex issue that is has thwarted sort of I think a satisfactory outcome for years, but also not to the to the um, dominance of other recreational issues that we want to make sure we give uh, that we address and that that are fairly seen and heard and and so that we don't just have the bicycle issue be the the primary one that, that is often the focus of, of a public meeting. I look forward to okay. seeing it when it comes back. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion to refer to the board? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, we have also public comment too. Oh, sure. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, Nona Davis. Ms. Davis, or Dennis, I apologize. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah, somehow or other, uh, 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 Terry, you just gotta remember that it's not Davis, it's Dennis. Okay, this happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm one of the stakeholders that ordinarily would show up uh, speaking for Marine Conservation League. Ordinarily would be uh, present at the watershed meeting, but I learned about this, that this uh, contract was going to be reviewed by you today and then go to the board. It will go to the watershed. But in the meantime, I want to emphasize that how significant, how important words are and the order of words in a contract, in the scope of work and the whole kind of approach to this, uh, to this assignment. Uh, above all, your two primary missions, your two primary parts of the mission which is to protect water quality and natural resource stewardship should take prominence throughout uh, with the understanding that you are accommodating recreation and have for more than 100, for 100 years. And that this is also uh, obviously an important use of the watershed. But the, when I talk about the subtlety of, of word order and how words are used, in one paragraph toward the end of the, of the scope of work, it says that Marine Water will work with a consultant to develop a holistic visitor management framework to guide watershed operations to support the different visitor goals while protecting water quality and biodiversity. I want to point out that throughout, you find that language kind of peppered as though the two are equal and they're not. Uh, we want to emphasize that over the years uh, and continuing that the protection of water quality and natural resources should always take precedence with the understanding that you are generously accommodating 101.8 million visitors who have, have, have interest in a variety, a variety of activities on the, on the watershed. Always, however, keep prominent those two primary missions. And bikes really are part of the whole mix, not primary in, my, in our view, but one of many, many uses that are accommodated by the water district. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Nora. Dennis. Um, we have two more speakers, uh, Larry Minikis and Linda Novi. Mr. Minikis, please. Yes, good morning, folks. Um, I'm, and rather than speaking straight, I'm gonna read uh, some of what I've written here. Okay, so a watershed recreational plan will have regional impact and must be looked at from that perspective. And the question is exactly what are the concerns being paid to produce here? Yeah. The concern with a recreation plan is that it is not to be viewed as a human-centered study, but as a wildlife biodiversity-centered process looking at how recreation best fits into the environment. If the plan's goal is to suggest how humans of various travel modes can better get along, then it's going to miss the mark. Preservation and ongoing protection of wildlife, flora, and fauna must remain the first priority here. Allow me to read a couple of quotes into the record that encapsulate the approach the study should and must take, and with the understanding that those sitting on the board do understand, are aware of what I'm going to read. So this is not a, a, a lesson, this is more to strengthen what, what has to happen here. This is from Wikipedia, and I don't think I've ever read from Wikipedia in a meeting before, but the Golden Gate Biosphere Network, GGBN, 
is an internationally recognized voluntary coalition of federal, state, and local government agencies, nonprofit organizations, universities, and private partners within the Golden Gate Biosphere region, which includes MMWD. The GGBN works toward protecting the biosphere biosphere regions biodiversity and conserving its natural resources to maintain quality to maintain the quality of life for people within the region the ggbn has been part of unesco's man and biosphere program since 1990 1988 and is part of the us biosphere network it is recognized by unesco due to a significant biodiversity of the region as well as the golden gate biosphere network's effort to demonstrate and promote a balanced relationship between humans and the biosphere. And then from the National Park Service website, the GGBN's rich mosaic of lands, water, and community calls for a new, calls for new integrative approaches and collaborative actions to steward its cherished places, conserve its biodiversity, and support the well-being of millions who live and work and recreate there. I ask that we think about this study in those terms to demonstrate and promote a balanced relationship between humans and the biosphere. So please, let's keep perspective on what is going to give us the most mileage here, focusing our energies, whether, where it will do the most long, uh, give the most long-term benefit to our environment. And with that, I will thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, Ms. Navi or Novi, please. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear, Linda. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I want to just remind the board of directors uh, and uh, the other, uh, the general manager and, and Sean, the watershed manager, that um, this study has to go beyond the literature and identify real problem areas on the ground. And there's some longstanding um, problems in illegal social trails that are in serious disrepair uh, and the watershed, but they also link to Marin County parks and other public lands. Uh, and the brunt of the user impact is really falling mostly on bike riders and a growing number of e-bike riders. I sent to the board this morning and to Ben, Sean has already seen it, um, a, a PDF of a PowerPoint that I presented at last week's MCL Parks and Open Space Committee meeting, citing the terrible, really terrible conditions off Pine Mountain Fire Road that exist on Happersburger Trail and then another trail from there, uh, the Y2K, that are damaging flora, fauna, and displacing foot people. Um, so I, I think there's probably other areas equally bad that need to be addressed. So I think that is very important. Um, also, I did look at the Alta planning website and it, 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 to me, and maybe I'm wrong, and I think it'd be something that the public would like to hear about. There seems to be an emphasis on you know, bike trail planning, but we have a whole variety of different kinds of visitation and there's a whole, slower user population, and I, I hate the word user, visitor population, equestrians, um, nature study, hikers, et cetera. Thank you for that, Terry. And um, I, to the metric piece and that Jack and both Jack and Cynthia mentioned, I think one of the metrics of success should be to measure a reduction in displacement of equestrians and hikers and people who are not riding bikes because there is real displacement going on. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Linda, thank you. a question. Yeah. What needs to be done to that trail to make it better? Uh, not, uh, thank, thank, yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, in the last, uh, one of the last slides in the PowerPoint that I sent to you is, are some suggestions for low hanging fruit um, closing, closing the trail is one, but even putting fencing up, some signs, there's not even signs that say no bikes. Enforcement, trail camera, and I cited what has been successful for the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, from their special recreation issue of 2020. 
And I'm happy to send you a link to that whole study if you would like. Um, I can send it to Ben and Sean uh, and they can provide it to you. But um, I, th I think at a minimum, um, the fencing signage, more coordinated enforcement with uh, Marin County Parks and the bike riders are coming down also at night through spotted owl habitat. Um, they're loud. I can see their lights coming down from Happersburger from my house and they neighbors on Canyon have trail cameras up and they, they ride through yelling, hooting. They've got boom, boom boxes on. It's, <laughs> it's a train wreck. Thank you for asking, Larry. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Jones. Could you respond to Ms. Novi's comments, please? Yes, in regards to all the background of Alta. <clears throat> yes, and to the bike issue versus the other activities. Yeah, first of all, Alta has been around for about 25 years. We're the oldest human powered consulting firm in the country and the, and the largest. And I think if you look at our website closely, you'll see that we do uh, trail master plans that are uh, focused on hikers and equestrians. We just finished the Great Redwood Trail feasibility study, which would be primarily hikers and equestrians. Um, we do a lot of pedestrian, uh, you know, foot powered studies. I think the reason you probably see more bike thing, bike projects on our website is simply that there's more money in that field. It's transportation dollars, but our folks are experts at every aspect of trail and uh, park and open space um, management. Thank you. I suggest you be prepared to address this subject fully, Sean and uh, Michael at the watershed meeting. Yeah, will do. Um, and I'll just remind everyone that, you know, Alta did assist the district in 2013 with doing our original um, user census survey. So this is, there's some consistency to updating the data collection and survey component through this contract as well, but they have a history of working with the district. And we look forward to their help. We have one more speaker. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, Tom Boss. Go ahead, Mr. Boss. Uh, yeah, good morning, um, uh, directors. Uh, Tom Boss, Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, just wanted to uh, make a few comments. Uh, first of all, when I visit the watershed, I don't see something I would um, label a train wreck. I see a beautiful you know, um, place for people to uh, engage with nature. Um, uh, if you show me a trail that has issues, I'll show you a trail that, that needs, you know, that probably wasn't built correctly or needs regular maintenance or should be rerouted. Um, so, and, and all in, in this and all the other comments that we've heard here, um, the issues raised, these are all things that will be covered in this, uh, in this plan. It, so it's really, um, and, and with everybody at the table. So I really <laughs> encourage uh, uh, to move this forward so we can get to work with all of our different stakeholders, look at the different challenges. And, uh, and, but at the same time, I think we have a civic duty to sit together and to uh, find solutions to these problems. And it might, might, uh, might mean compromise. It might mean uh, thinking outside the box, being open-minded, putting ourselves in the other person's shoes, those kinds of things. So, uh, and, and, and throughout the scoping, which I was involved in, everybody agreed that, that uh, the protection of the watershed and, and the biodiversity is, 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 is goal one and uh, goes hand in hand with uh, accommodating recreation. So anyway, I, I think you have a good start here and I hope you move this forward soon so we can get to work. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chair Russell, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Navi would like to finish her comments. She had like 20 seconds left on, so. Okay. I, all right, okay. go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Navi, or Novi, I apologize. Oh. Thank you. No, I'm complete. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Your hand kept raising. Okay. Oh, oh I'm, that was just a, a, a boo-boo on the keyboard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. There are no further comments. Any other comments from the board? Okay. Item three. Phoenix Lake Transfer Pump Project. Hi, good morning, directors. I'm uh, Alex Anaya, the engineer manager design mm -hmm. section. 
Uh, I want to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation this morning. Let's get this going. Okay, are you seeing the PowerPoint up up on this slide? Yeah. Yes. All right. So we have um, the display settings need to change. Yeah. And the up top left, Alex, change it. We see the preview. So the next slide, you need to click that on the top left. Uh, display display settings. settings. Swap presenter. There you go. <laughs> Okay. okay, still gets me every time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, directors. Again, I'm Alex and I, engineer, manager, design section. Uh, this morning, I'll be providing an informational PowerPoint presentation oops, sorry, on the opportunity to upgrade our, our water transmission system, uh, which includes enhancing enhancing the district's ability to better utilize our stored water at Phoenix Lake uh, through the Phoenix Lake wa uh, raw water transmission pump station. So. So uh, before we kind of continue, uh, here are some important facts about Phoenix Lake. Uh, Phoenix Lake was constructed in the early 1900s and historically uh, Phoenix Lake has been used as a water supply source when Lake Lagunitas became insufficient to meet water demands at the time. Uh, uh, Phoenix Lake has a storage capacity of 411 acre feet, uh, which represents about half of 1% of the district's total storage uh, system of 79,000 acre feet. Uh, the primary use today for the lake is for recreational purposes, including hiking, fishing, cycling, amongst other things, and is a very popular destination for a lot of, of folks here in Marin County and, and about as well. And uh, currently, each time the district decides to utilize Phoenix Lake water for production, it requires uh, an, in an intensive system modification before we could start any pumping activities. Next slide. So... This slide kind of shows a proposed routes of a new water transmission line from Phoenix Lake to uh, on Tempe Lake. Uh, there are sections currently in our existing transmission system that do have redundant lines that could be utilized to minimize the amount of new pipe installed uh, to make, the, make these improvements more cost effective to the district. Uh, the yellow line represents existing sections of raw water pipe it can be reused. So we got a section from the lake to Eldridge grade and from Pond Tempe Lake down to the, to the treatment plant on Filter Plant Road. Uh, this orange line represents about a 1900 foot section of new system piping that would need to be installed between Eldridge grade and Filter Plant Road, uh, along with a, a valve cluster that would allow a raw water transmission from the lake uh, directly up to the treatment plant or to the lake itself on Pond Tempe. Uh, currently on Filter Plant Road, there are two raw water transmission lines that convey water from Bon Tempe to the treatment plant. Um, one of these water lines could be repurposed by tying into the new connection point coming up from Eldridge Grade. And this would provide um, you know, additional uh, the capability to flow raw water from, bon, uh, from uh, Phoenix Lakes, excuse me, to Bon Tempe directly, while still providing functionality if we ever wanted to flow water back from Bon Tempe Lake to the treatment plant by valving off a couple of uh, improvements at this uh, intersection. Um, there would also be about 300 feet of new system piping improvements at the existing Phoenix transfer pump station that would also need to occur to permanently configure the new raw water system to its own dedicated raw water line. Um, alternatively, uh, we could install about 5,500 feet of new uh, piping between Phoenix Lake and Bon Tempe but by repurposing uh, some of the existing pipeline that we currently have, we could you know, substantially cut our pipeline installation cost by more than half, I estimate about 65%. Uh, so currently here's a, an image on the left of the existing Phoenix Lake barge. And on the right is the uh, pump station itself. So currently when we pump from Phoenix Lake, it goes via the barge up to uh, an 18 inch pipe on Phoenix Road to the pump station. Uh, prior to doing any pumping, we have to do some system modifications where we uh, disconnect the potable system and then connect the raw water system to pump so we can convey water from the pump station up to the treatment plant for uh, treatment. And then once we're done pumping from Phoenix, then we have to go through a pretty uh, extensive process of flushing and disinfecting the line 
before we reconnect it back to the potable system. So uh, based on this overview, uh, the district would need to make uh, some following infrastructure improvements to make this happen. Uh, we would need to install a new dedicated raw water pump near the existing pump station. Uh, we would repurpose uh, one of the existing raw water lines on Filter Plant Road uh, that would convey water uh, to Bone Tempe Lake. Uh, the installation of a total of 2,200 feet of new piping, that's piping from Eldridge Grade up to Filter Plant Road and the 300 linear feet of uh, piping at the existing uh, pump station. We would also need to do some system improvements at the Phoenix Transfer Pump Station, which include like some PLC controllers for SCADA and some valving. Um, so the estimated cost for these uh, infrastructure improvements is between three and $5 million. And that's depending on the pumping capacity that this project would be designed to. So district staff will be evaluating pumping flow rates between one and 10 million gallons a day just to evaluate different cost options and try to kind of dial that number down a little bit better. So um, the water supply benefit by doing this would be to increase the, um, the district's ability to improve operational efficiency and allow frequent use of our water without the need of all the laborious uh, modifications prior to doing any well water pumping. Uh, in addition, uh, the current estimates are that we could gain about 300 to 600 acre feet of water that could be transferred upon Tempe Lake uh, during dry, uh, dry years, depending on the rain events. And just as a comparison, uh, in 2021, the district pumped approximately 250 acre feet from uh, Phoenix Lake up to the treatment plant for production. Alex, Alex, if I could jump in here. Sure. Um, also, one other improvement with this would be going lake to lake provides some mixing of the water with mm -hmm. the Bon Tempe Lake, and we wouldn't have really drastic water quality changes at the treatment plant. And because when that happens, they have to make really big adjustments to their chemical feed systems if they're going straight from right. Phoenix Lake to the Bon Tempe treatment plant. And sometimes it can cause turbidity issues within the plant. So to go from the lake to the lake actually provides the treatment plant better um, water quality um, parameters. Yes, th thank you for bringing that up too. That's, that's a great point. And, uh, in addition to that, uh, district staff have recently been approached by Marin County Flood Control Agency, and they are interested in partnering and co-funding a project that would involve in using Phoenix Lake for flood control purposes during wet winter years. Uh, additional discussion uh, is still needed to determine how much flood detention Marin County is interested in obtaining, which in turn would de uh, determine the size of the pump or pumps needed uh, to address any atmospheric river event. Uh, so district staff will continue to be partnering and working with uh, Marin County Flood Control Agency, and uh, we'll be bringing back to the board at a future date uh, an MOU uh, to conduct hydrological analysis and preliminary design. So um, with that, I will take uh, any, any questions. So Alex, um, I really like this project. Um, cool. And, um, you know, I think it could have a lot of um, maybe other future uses. Um, you know, one I'm thinking is if CMSA did some kind of uh, reverse osmosis, um, Phoenix could become a, a repository for RO water. So you'd have indirect potable use, so you could pump from the RO station to Phoenix and then from Phoenix up to Bon Tempe, but that's obviously a long way off at this point. Mm -hmm. um, is the cost estimate that you gave three to 5 million, does that include repurposing the existing pipe? It, it, it does, and it also has a lot to do with the level of pumping we need to do at a certain rate to meet the flood control needs of the uh, flood control district. So, um, yeah, we need to do some more evaluation of the, of the system just to make sure where we might have additional pipe that we can be used, uh, but that's that does include repurposing some of that pipe. And have you guys, I'm oh, sorry, I was just going to say, have you looked at the existing pipe to see what kind of shape it's in? Yes, uh, most of the pipe that we're looking at is from like the mid 70s. So in its welded steel pipe that's in good shape that we currently use when we do this process. So this this uh, uh, installation of the 1900 feet is just a uh, a separate pipe altogether just to have a dedicated raw water line from the Phoenix Lake up to uh, Bon Tempe Lake. 
Okay, I've got a couple other questions. So go, Ben, why don't you jump in? I, I just wanted to briefly note that uh, the preliminary discussions with county flood control and the continuing ones would uh, be around the lines, probably uh, obviously obvious to the board and that um, to the extent the costs are driven by flood control, we would look for the county to fund those elements, both in the capital as well as ongoing operations. The synergy is obvious in that our interest is during dry year use, using this for water supply and their interest is during a wet year. So there is an opportunity, but um, probably a bit of discussions and details um, to be worked out for sure. Yeah, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up um, is that the last um, study I saw from Flood District 9 there's a um, uh, appendix, I think it's appendix E, and um, I'll, I can send it to Alex, I'll send it, to, I've sent it to Ben, but I'll, I can send it around again. But basically there's a number of areas in the lake that are subject to sliding if there's rapid um, water uh, level loss. So, uh, and there's several areas that are mapped in, in the study that I think we need to take a look at. Absolutely. I'll just weigh in too. I, I say I really like this project as well. Um, I love when we can combine um, a project that generates water supply with, with flood protection. Um, and to that end, you know, Alex, as this moves, as the analysis moves forward, it'd be great to understand the extent uh, to which in, um, implementing this project would increase uh, flood protection for, for downstream um, <clears throat> homes and community um, areas. Um, you know, uh, it could have, a, I don't know to the extent that it will have a significant impact, but if it's large enough, it could have implications for people's flood insurance and other things that, that you know, reduce costs for our, for our, um, for our, um, for our customers. So I think it would just be great to let's pay attention to what those benefits are and make sure that we highlight them when we when we talk when we talk about them when we have them. Because I think that's a good thing for folks to be aware of. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna chime in with my support as well. Um, and I'm gonna particular particularly the um, the opportunity to move towards this more one water space yeah. where we're integrating our, you know, our our flood management with our drinking water. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity and hopefully we'll open the door to doing more of that kind of thing with, uh, with other um, flood districts as well as, um, you know, as well as other agencies, you know, with um, responsibility for stormwater runoff. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I uh, absolutely agree too. I, I definitely appreciate the creative thinking here. Um, I mean, it, it's, it just highlights the, the, the district and congratulations to you folks, you show as well. <clears throat> also, uh, on the, the one water concept Cynthia mentioned, we talk a lot about one water projects at the North Bay watershed. Not that often do we actually have real projects that we can exactly. point to and say, you know, hallelujah, there's there's one. <laughs> and once again, Alex, you've given me something to take back to the North Bay watershed <laughs> and you know make myself look really pretty good. So appreciate it. Fantastic. Yeah. So, sorry to be the wet blanket here, but I, I don't see quite the synergism. Synergism. It seems the cost is very high to me for one half percent of our water. I think the flood control aspect is interesting, but you got to understand the way you get flood control is by emptying the reservoir. So that, that, that we did a big study on this with the county five years ago or eight years ago, something like that, and we were close. But then the decision was the cost was too high to make it practical. So recovering the water makes it interesting. You could empty the reservoir into another reservoir. That's an interesting concept, but you have to be prepared to have Phoenix Lake empty during that time aesthetically so you know just be aware that it, it it's one of those things that sounds good but the practicality is what exactly what ben said they're they are completely 180 degrees opposite the the for our end we need to keep it full from there and they need to keep it empty so just just keep that in mind one thing that caught me off guard alex was is the regional board cool with using a potable water line as a raw water line and then converting it back I mean, that's kind of the definition of a backflow or a cross connection. Currently in the North, oh, Paul, do you? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. 
Oh yeah, uh, currently in order to make that happen, there is a, a physical break between the raw and the potable system. So that, like, there's a, a, a pretty substantial amount of piping reconfiguration that needs to occur to flow the raw water back up to the treatment plant. So once that happens, there is no physical connection to the potable drinking water system. So- um, Until you put the line back in service. Exactly, and then we have to flush it, disinfect it before we make a, a disconnection and system modifications of the piping to reconnect it back to the potable drinking water system. So- the, and I, Go yeah. ahead. Oh yeah, so there's really, it's either gonna be flowing potable or raw water currently as it's functioning. And so there's really no way to cross contaminate at this time the way it's set up. Famous last words. Um, so, so President Russell, know. along those lines, if I could, um, as you noted, the water supply benefit, both because of the size of the lake, as well as that now we can manually do the operation is somewhat limited. The numbers we showed is reflecting that were this a uh, system that was designed, we would be able to do it more often, both because we wouldn't have the heavy labor and also because what Crystal noted, sometimes the turbidity at Phoenix is such, we just can't feed it directly to the treatment plant. So, but we are talking dry years. So um, maybe it's three times instead of one time during a dry year, pretty marginal. But as Director Bragman noted, it may provide opportunities over the long term as well. Yeah, and I think Director Bragman's comment was the, the most interesting one I heard today was the idea of being able to use the line for other purposes. That's exciting. Um, whether it's worth three to $5 million at this point, that's one that's gonna have to swallow pretty hard. I mean, we're talking over $10,000 an acre foot uh, on at least a one year basis. So I, I don't know what we predict going forward, the, the long-term sustainable yield from Phoenix would be and how much aesthetic impact we're willing to tolerate on Phoenix. Um, I mean, I, I presume, and Jack could speak to this better than me, that Phoenix was a key part of the old water system at one point in time. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and you know, um, if, if I could just one other, uh, outstanding is how much of the project will be funded by county flood control as well. Yeah, of course, understand that, like I say, this got real close before, Ben. And what I remember the conclusion was, because I was very active in the joint group between the county and the district, was that it just wasn't big enough to be interesting to the county. That's what I recall, that they just turned the burners down when they said, you know, it's just not large enough. Uh, to have a significant impact on a, a significant number of people on the creek. That's what I remember the conclusion being. I could be wrong, but, you know, uh, maybe they're interested and maybe they're not. I mean, obviously, and I pushed it hard when this was up the last time, anything is better than nothing. But, you know, the pump station, if, if you don't do this in a systematic way, and this reminds me, Jack, very much of uh, Lake Mendocino, uh, thing that Jared got so involved with. Right. This is the problem. You have to drain it down in anticipation of the event. Now, the good part is we capture all the water that's being drained down. The bad part is it's going to sit empty for until it's ne needed. So, you know, you got to kind of think about how this thing all integrates together because it's, it's one of those things that sounds really good. But like I say, the, the county basically, as I recall, said, no, we're not interested. In, in that, what uh, Director Russell, if I could, that, that, that last um, idea, the, the study that was done was to actually raise the level of the dam to provide more storage, mm -hmm. and yep. that yep. in itself was cost prohibitive. So this is a completely different concept to uh, pump it up to the other lake. So we're, we'll be doing more analysis for sure. But Crystal, to raise the dam, I mean, the reason for that is to get more storage, right? So right. because the current storage wasn't adequate. So, you know, that's, I agree with your assessment, but the, the driving force, as I recall, was we're too small to be useful to the county. That's what I remember in the discussions. I could be completely wrong, but that's what I recall. Well, I think it's gonna be bigger than any detention pond that's been built so far, so. Um, that's true. 
That's true. We could also yes. look at what just happened in the recent October storms too. I mean, I think that would probably be a great metric for to consider consider as a you know whether we would operate the the lake to be that low in on into the future. But I think in terms of what it what I've heard, anecdotally heard in terms of the benefits it provided to flood protection in the October storm events was pretty significant. So that might be worth looking into. Yeah, and I, I just um, want to say, you know, the comments I get from the folks that were following the, the that project uh, emphasize that whole um, uh, lake bank uh, instability uh -huh. question and the landslide question. So that that was kind of a big issue for those folks. So um, we're going to need to deal with that, and that's got to be kind of figured out to, to avoid any kind of landslide instability. Absolutely. Um, what I recall, uh, Monty, in that uh, numbers from the previous study was that, that taking uh, even the reservoir empty at 600 acre feet, it, it's like uh, what I remember, and I could be completely wrong, it's like 20 minutes or an hour of, of, of creek flow fills it something like that when it's at peak flood. So, but like I say, I could be, it's, it's a long time ago, I could be fuzzy on the details. Um, but like I say, if, if the county's interested and, and Ben, you're exactly right, if they wanna pay, uh, I think it's a cute, nice thing, recovering the water for drinking water and then getting the volume for, for storage and then getting to pump it again, right? To recover that water, um, maybe after first flush, but, uh, yeah, and it and it and it could be a piece of uh, of an indirect potable reuse project at some point. So yes, one sir. other question I have for um, Alex is: Are you are we just going to disconnect the line that goes direct to Bon Tempe treatment plant? Is that just going to be abandoned completely? The, the the current line that we're using. Yeah, I mean, th what's the point of even having it anymore? You no, know, the, the, the point is to provide uh, system functionality to pump from Pine Mountain Tunnel up into Bon Tempe. So that would still maintain its purpose and the secondary line would actually be the gravity from Bon Tempe back down into Ross Reservoir. So those, the, the, that system would stay. So we would have a dedicated raw water line altogether. No, I mean the, the line from Phoenix to Bon Tempe treatment plant. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it, would, it would be, no, that, that wouldn't, that that's going to be abandoned, right? I mean, it's really, there's no... It, well, it wouldn't be abandoned. It'd be repurposed to reconvey the water to the lake instead. Okay. okay. Yeah, they just turn it and go to the lake from the... Okay, plant. okay. Yes. Okay. You just put a valve in and... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting... I, you know, I to, to squeeze another 500 acre feet per year out of Phoenix, I think is worth it. So that's kind of where I land on it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, and if nothing else, I don't know that we need to debate who remembers what from when. I mean, you know, the important thing is to go forward, get the information, figure out where our partners are at and make a decision down the road. We've got plenty of time for that. I, I, I'm not worried about who remembers what. I was just trying to input the information that happened the last time. I think we should hear from the county, Ben, and find out where they're at. Because uh, like I say, this got pretty far along the last time, and then they turned the burners off. Yeah, what we they actually <clears throat> did um, initiate the discussions. They had some, and they have some grant funding. And um, the, there's not a lot of ripe opportunities for them. So they're um, are they're interested. I I do think some of the details that you talked about and we've thought about in terms of effective. Uh, storage for flood control and it, some of it really rests when you think about back-to-back -back storms as Alex was noting on the pumping capacity right. and that, right. that drives right. capital costs so it, it, it really is and uh, will be an ongoing discussion and this is preliminary but we do appreciate what we're hearing from the board yeah yeah it drives capital and operating you right. know the problem with the pump station I mean the largest pump station in the United States is the one in New Orleans that pumps a billion gallons a day um, and it, it is larger than the general office building at MMWD, the pump station. And, you know, if you're only going to get 10 MGD or one MGD, 
out of a pump station that can pump 500 MGD, you know, it's a lot of capital. And that's the problem with blending the two projects that don't necessarily mesh real well. If you can pick away at it and decide in August that we're going to have a wet winter and we need to dewater the reservoir, then you can do it at an MGD or a 2 MGD or 5 MGD. If you got to do it overnight, then we're talking about six foot diameter pipes and, you know, thousand horsepower pumps. So yeah, that, that's but, exactly where we're headed, that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I say, uh, I mean, uh, for those who don't remember, I, I recall there was a presentation at the dock. There was a joint meeting between the county and the district. I mean, we got as far as an MOU or a contract, but it just didn't happen. It, it, the county pulled the pulled the rug on us. Yeah, as I, I mean, remember it. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I have a vaguer sense of it, but I, I just think it's a different time. and It's worth worth getting into. Actually, um, if um, I have Elizabeth Lewis from the county who is oh, good, here, if, good, um, good. If we want to hear from her and get a couple of public comments. So let me try to sure. get her on. All right, Miss Lewis, are you? Can you? Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud yes. and clear. Oh, great. <clears throat> Thank you, board members, and um, you know, I really want to acknowledge um, Ben and and his staff for bringing um, this proposal to you this morning. You know, it, it was evident after the October 24th atmospheric river, um, you know, that there was really uh, some opportunity and we really did notice um, the value of Phoenix Lake, at, at least in the, you know, the first half of that storm. And, um, you know, at least that at, in the community, we heard from a lot of, um, you know, folks that really felt like uh, Phoenix Lake being empty prior to that event. Uh, probably, uh, you know, resulted in, you know, less flooding in, in, in Ross and downstream. Um, so, so that was really observed kind of watershed wide from, from Ross, Kentfield downstream. And we just really appreciate the partnership and, and we really appreciate your staff taking the time today to present and present, um, you know, give us some updated information that we can work with you all on to try to further this concept uh, at Phoenix Lake, you know, as um, as uh, Mr. Bragman brought up, you know, with the exception of the Sunnyside detention, which is now being constructed off of Fairfax Creek, as you are all well aware, the concept of constructing, um, you know, detention in the watershed has been challenging to say the least. And so, you know, the, the opportunity to try to look at a potential for a, a different way of operating Phoenix Lake for you know integrated purposes of potable water and flood risk reduction is, is really a key one and really important. And so I just want to say we really value the partnership and we really value working with you all and you know looking ahead at, at what will be needed to to continue to evaluate this this new opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just say one thing, uh, I, I, my I I I tip my hat to Liz uh, Liz Lewis. Uh, I mentioned the North Bay Watershed uh, Association a minute ago and how we talk one water. Liz was there at the creation. She's one of the original mm -hmm. North Bay Watershed Foundation, so she, she knows of what she speaks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack. Um, A public comment. Yeah, there's one more, Sandra Goldman. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, uh, I'm Sandy Goldman, uh, very active in the watershed with Friends of Corte Madera Creek Watershed. And I may be out of date. But there, it used to require, I think, a, a water board permit to move water from one drainage basin to another. Taking water from Phoenix Lake up to Bon Tempe would do precisely that. Do you have the permits or is that no longer necessary? We'll, we'll be looking at a range of issues, and that certainly is one of them. So th thank you for that comment. This is very preliminary discussion. Yeah, and I would love to sh give Larry a shout out for mentioning uh, the indirect reuse of treated sewage. I think that is the most viable long-term solution we have for our water supply. Yeah. That's another issue. <laughs> thank you. Um, there are no further speakers. Okay. So 
uh, I think that's all we have on this one. Unless you see something further, Ben. Okay, great. Okay, item four, board resolution on water supply policies. Yeah, good morning, uh, board members. Uh, Paul Sellier, operations director. Um, I'll do a, so, so the policy on, uh, I guess the title is climate change and water supply resiliency. I'll just briefly review that and then towards the end, um, we'll, we'll tee up this discussion on the, the key kind of elements of this uh, policy, at least as we see it. So, so for any folks in the public, um, at the board's direction, uh, staff have drafted a, a resolution to provide clarity and um, guidance to staff in the prioritization of projects and concepts and initiatives around you know, climate change and water supply resiliency. And we brought this to the finance committee at the end of January and sort of enjoyed uh, a nice little discussion and, and pretty broad support across the, the board members, I would say, just in general. Um, and so we're, we're bringing it back again for a little bit more thought and discussion. Um, in, in its present form, the draft resolution has sort of four basic elements, I would say. The first, and this is sort of where the devil is in the details, the first one, um, and, and I'll just run through them and then we'll, we'll tee up the discussion, but it is around this notion of you know, adequate water supply to meet 100% of, as it's written, the three-year average demand, and, and we'll get back to that in a minute, un under normal conditions. So average, meet enough water to meet average demand under normal Hydrologic, hydrologic conditions. <clears throat> and then the second part of that is uh, and enough water to meet 80% of demand during drought conditions. And that's another aspect that we'll, we'll, we'll want to talk a little bit about in a second. The other um, second major element there is a, a direction to staff to, to do a water supply assessment, um, which of course, as, as you know, we're getting that underway already. And then uh, sort of a couple elements on annual reporting, one of which is, is to report out on how is our water supply for the current water year and what about the, you know, the following water year. So sort of a short-term reporting to the board in the May timeframe, so it's after rains have, have come. And nothing's stopping us from doing it before that, but we just thought we'd put a marker in there so that there was something on the calendar. And then similarly, in terms of the long-term measures that we come up with, there's a reporting element, I think it's in July, at the first board meeting in July, um, where we would report out on, you know, the, the sort of progress towards longer term water supply resiliency goals that, that we establish. So in terms of the, the first key points and to tee up the discussion, as we think about, there's some, some words that we use in, in, in this section on average demand and, um, so it is three years the right average, right? And we were talking with, with staff and if it's rainy or if it's been very dry, is, is a three year average the right number? Um, and I think we need to do a little bit more thinking on that and, and maybe come back to you, but obviously interested in your thoughts today on, on what sort of uh, an average might be, might be useful. And then the second piece, um, you know, 80%, we're suggesting that 80% of average demand could be met in a drought. And recognizing as we you know, have written that, thinking about what we mean by drought, in other words, a one-year drought, a three-year drought, or very different kind of propositions when it comes to you know, projects and things that we would need to put into place on the ground. So I think we need to think carefully and strategically about what we mean by drought. Um, and of course, you know, this is intended to be a living document and um, will be informed. I think one of the first aspects of our water supply assessment is to look at just that sort of very question as to what is the, the right hydrologic uh, uh, conditions for us to, uh, to think about. So interested in, in your thoughts um, on those two issues, you know, average demand um, and, and then this notion of drought and any thoughts from the board would be appreciated. As, as I understand it, Paul, we, uh, 
we're we now have a I think it was 2.2 year uh, supply is, is that what, what what our base is and so the three year you're talking about uh, that's that I gather that's in play I mean you're still doing that analysis that number may go up uh, yeah so, so so I guess that's the, that's one of the confusions and, and I apologize it's probably the way I wrote uh, the, the policy but what we really mean by the three-year average is the three-year average demand. I see. So not really talking about supply as a number because that's so dependent on what, what drought conditions you choose, you know, um, what, what the hydrologic circumstances are. And we, we, we do say that if there's no rain at all, what ones were full, yeah, there's about 2.2 years. But most years it rains. It's just a question of, it's, it's that risk analysis that we need to look at and, and think about and capture in the frame in the right way uh, so that we can really, yeah. Yeah, can I just, ju just to jump in for a second, I think, um, I think I like the new policy, um, you know, reading the draft policy. Um, I think it's good to have it. I think it's important for the public and, um, you know, and, and for the district itself to have that kind of guidance as a as a foundation, but I, I agree it shouldn't be, um, you know, prescriptive. So to answer your two questions, I think what would be helpful, I think for the board, I think as well as for management would be to start with what is the industry standard or to the, or even asking an earlier question, is there an industry standard, right? Um, so I, I think that it gets unpacked a few ways, right? The industry standard in Massachusetts and Florida, Hawaii are not gonna be our standard, right? So I guess think the question is, is there, um, is there one or more you know, industry standards either in California, across the West, you know, comparable areas that are also grappling with this issue? Um, and if there's not an industry standard that you can identify, um, I think that in itself is interesting, but I, I don't think we should be um, attempting to go at this as a, as a board Without that kind of um, that kind of background, without really having a sense of, um, you know, where is, you know, where is the rest of the sector going on these issues? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we can come up with whatever we want, of course, but yeah. I'm just saying, I think I think we need to start with. What are our colleagues doing? How are they thinking about it? And how are the associations dealing with it, right? I mean, there's the American Water Works Association spends a lot of time on this kind of thing. I think the Cal Nevada section probably has got a fair amount of guidance. Um, you know, and then there's all the other, you know, related associations that um, I think also try to provide this kind of foundation for um, districts pretty much exactly like ours. Right. And I want to say, I, I also, I, I agree with, uh, with the comments and I and appreciate staff bringing this and I think this is a really is a really important um, resolution for us to send the message that we, we despite what our water supply scenario is today because of the unprecedented October we had we still have a water supply um, emergency of sorts that we need to really meaningfully address I, I think figuring out what the standard is I agree with Cynthia's comments I, I would also say add to that I want to make sure that whatever the industry standard is that we're looking at that we also look at it um, at those numbers in the context of climate change because those numbers may already be out of date and we're trying to come up with I think a, a, an objective that is that is a climate safe objective that gives us the water supply reliability we want into the future knowing that things are changing. Yeah to be clear I'm sorry I, I thought that was I thought that was implied. Obviously, we're not looking at the industry standard from, you know, years ago, um, because I think the industry is grappling with exactly this. That's part of the reason I'm suggesting it. Um, you know, more and more, I feel like every conference I'm invited to starts with what are we going to do about climate change? There's a very strong consensus, I think, out there that the past is no longer prologue. And, um, and there's an enormous amount of research about, um, you know, how climate change projections, which have been incredibly accurate, um, if somewhat conservative, um, is going to affect the, the water sector. I mean, you guys are probably dialed into, um, you know, the decision center at ASU, and there's another one at, at, at Colorado State University. I mean, there's a there's a huge, huge amount of um, resources out there for district like ours trying to address this in, as Monty says, the context of climate change. And if you need those contexts, I can provide them to you. Yeah, the the the. The key word, and Cynthia mentioned it, is the messaging that this carries. When I threw this idea out at our opening meeting this year, 
uh, my concept was exactly that. Uh, we're coming off of a drought. What we need, to, we need to do is to send a clear message to the public and a policy will do that, uh, that says our goal is to increase the security of our supply, you know, period. That's, that's the objective. How we build the policy and the words we use in it, obviously are gonna, gonna vary, but, uh, but that's the purpose. And I think this policy does hit that purpose. You know, um, I actually, I haven't read it um, that closely, but, you know, as we go through climate change, I think to me, it's becoming clear that our expected yield out of the watershed may not be um, so predictable. Um, so I don't know whether our annual um, demand there should be some language in here about demand or keeping demand stable. Um, I'd be real interested in seeing what our last year's uh, demand was totally uh, with drought, whether we are down to 20,000 acre feet. We were averaging 25,000 acre feet, which I, I thought was pretty good considering what a drop it was from years ago when it was you know, 30, 35,000. But, you know, I think we may be looking at, you know, um, uh, annual yield of 20,000 acre feet a year to be safe. So, I mean, you know, uh, Larry Russell was talking about it uh, the other day, you know, demand versus supply, you know, how do those two fit together? And, you know, I think they're sort of inextricably intertwined and um, it's, it is a complicated calculation. So I, I'd be very interested if uh, Director Kohler would circulate those uh, links uh, for us to look at. But, you know, I know when uh, the district um, had its first uh, moratorium on building, what, what drove the decision in that case was that district officials recalculated the yield of the reservoirs and found to their amazement it was way less than they had previously believed. And we may be going into a period like that. So, um, you know, I'm glad it, it mentions climate change and resiliency, but um, it's, 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 I think gonna be a very, difficult thing to do to put a policy together um, that really addresses all the all the issues and challenges that we're facing. If if I could briefly um, just reflect, we have this policy we're working on, and we also have the initial task of the water supply assessment and how they're kind of conceptually could come together in that this is a level of service policy, right? This is a board saying that in a drought, we wanna be able to supply 80% of demand. So we won't, our goal is not to ask for greater than 20% on an annual basis of water conservation, if you look at it that way. And this sort of level of service brings in both the supply side and the demand side in somewhat of a fluid way over time as we understand things better. And it builds kind of a foundation for the next step in the water supply assessment when we're looking at how much water supply, additional supplemental supply we may need to meet this policy level of service. Yeah, and I, I that, that helps, that helps understand it. I, I just, Integrating supply and demand, I think maybe that should be somewhere in the policy that we'll continue to encourage and not subsidize, but maybe subsidize is the word, efficiency and conservation. Yeah, you know, I think we should I, be subsidizing it. Maybe maybe the word is incentivized, but yeah. Incentivize, it's, <laughs> a, better, it's a better word. But, you know, I just think it's, you know, 
I mean, we're not going to be meeting the challenge unless we do that, because we're going to have some population growth. It's not going to be huge, but it's 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 going to happen. And, you know, we I think we need to attack the issue from both sides. So I think, you know, that needs to be part of this policy and it needs to be called out. And I know we're going to get criticized and this, that and the other thing. But it's like, hey, <laughs> you know, it, it's reality, you know. And, you may uh, get criticized, but I think we'll also be supported because I, I think um, because I think and I really want to say that I, I agree with all of Larry Bragman's comments right now. Um, I think it's I think it's important to call these things out because sometimes when you say, especially to the world that doesn't deal with water every day, um, you know, we're going to have whatever three or four years of supply. There's this view that demand is immutable, right? The demand does not change and that we simply have to then go out and find the supply to meet in none, an unchanging demand. And certainly we have a good 20 years here of demonstrating that's completely false. You know, our, not only is our per capita fallen, but our overall demand has, to Larry's point, um, sometimes fallen pretty low. So I think anything that we do in this policy needs to point out that part of the calculation of what constitutes whether we pick three or four or 10 or how many years you want um, is not just augmented supply, but also reduced demand on a permanent basis. Yeah, or integrating the two. It, you know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, exactly. we 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 the augmentation is security, you know, but we can get some security with the incentivizing of conservation. So I think it the policy should at least um, you know include that type of uh, language in it, just yeah. so it's there because it's it's important, you know, the degree of course, is always going to be, you know, debated and it's going to depend on circumstances, but uh, both are very in integral to, you know, our future water resiliency. I, I think that's absolutely right. But my concern is uh, that uh, uh, we don't say enough. We will meet the demand. If it requires getting new water, we will get that. Yeah. We will, we will expect you to conserve, you know, but, but we will reach out for new water however we can can meet that challenge as well and i think I, we are all saying that i, I well, think I, I i think so but what i'm worried about i mean the the initiative for the policy was that we're not making it clear enough that we won't just ask for more conservation yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i think that's right and i think that's fair i mean i think that's really i think what we're all saying is that we need to do both right yeah. i know we are saying that and i agree uh, but I'm worried about muffling in saying both. If we don't do it carefully, we muffle mm. what is the very purpose of the initiative. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's got to be it's got to be wordsmith carefully. I I, I mean, right. I agree. That's, That's why you know I think incentivizing and you know balancing and all those type of words need to be put in there. But you know, I think right. I think both need to be included in because. <laughs> It's just, it's what we got to do. I mean, you know, it's just. But Jack raises yeah. a really important point about messaging, which I think is different than the policy. I mean, it, it's not separate from it, but um, yeah. so I think that really needs to be a full board conversation as opposed to just having it messaged and then it being announced to us. So I think that's something we're going to want to be, at least I'm hearing in this conversation, pretty much everybody's going to be want to want to have some strong input into that until something goes public. Right. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Well, I mean, that's what we're doing right now, and I'm sure Paul is is making copious notes. <laughs> we we, sure. we are, but we're not. I'm just saying, there's the policy, and then there's the messaging, and you know, sometimes messages go out before they've had a chance to really be vetted. <laughs> so yeah, and sometimes messages get distorted too by depending how they're, <laughs> they're stated. So yeah. Exactly. You can't really avoid that. But I think as far as, you know, drafting this thing. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can integrate both. And I think we should. And I, I do get Jack's concern about like drowning out another bad uh, pun, but um, augmentation and water security. I mean, I do think that's right. legitimate and, and, and very necessary. I support getting clear about that too. I, 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 we need to make sure that people understand that, that we are looking at both conservation oh. as well as new supply. And I, I also want to suggest that we also in this resolution um, have some something that, that gives us some sense of annual reporting on the progress we're making toward new supply 
and, and new supplies separate from conservation, but I would like to see both um, presented. But I would like to see us make sure that we're showing progress as well as being able to say where we think we are, we can, what we can achieve going forward so that there's a little bit of a, we have a little bit of a goal and that we are trying to hold ourselves to, to see how we're making progress. And, you know, things come up and, and opportunities can speed things up like we saw with Castania in a really dramatic shift. Other things take more time when we have pandemics and, and supply chain issues and other things. But I do think that the public wants to see us um, be more articulate about our goals and objectives and the progress we're making. So I'd like to see that part of what we put together. Right, I 100% agree with that. And that's exactly why uh, I suggested we bring back our drought resiliency committee. We had that committee for four years. Uh, it's, we didn't have any meetings whatsoever in 2021. Um, I don't know why, but uh, I think it's time we bring that committee back. I think that's a great suggestion, Jack. And, and, and it, you know, it's something that we've talked about. And I, I, and I, and I think that when we think of drought resiliency, I, I think drought is often sometimes the problem that we think because droughts happen and then they go away. Our water supply resiliency is never going to go away. We're always going to need to have an eye on that. So I, I think as we, again, messaging is important um, for folks. I think making sure that we're, we're looking at, 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 we're always looking at the resiliency of our, of our water supply and that that's never going to come off the table anymore because it's always going to be an issue for us in, for the decades to come. In responding to Cynthia's question um, about the standards for storage, I'm not aware of any written standards, uh, Cynthia, and I could be incorrect about that. Um, I didn't mean I'm sorry, I didn't mean standards in the sense of enforceable standards. I'm just saying it, no, maybe, best, maybe best practice no, I, is a better way to put I, it. I, I understand. I understand. Let me just finish. Okay. Uh, my experience with large water companies like the City of New York is that uh, LA Water and Power, they strive for four years of raw water storage. So that's, that's the number I'm familiar with, and that's the number I've been harping about. Uh, you may also recall me mentioning Dallas. Dallas went through a severe drought about 10 years ago, and they basically said, never again. And they went out and built 10 reservoirs around the city of Dallas. Now, um, I'm looking at a report, Paul, which I'm going to send you. I was searching to see what Dallas's raw water storage is, and I'm sure it's in the report I have in front of me, but I can't find it. Um, but there's a table I'm looking at right now, which is quite interesting. It's called Preferred Strategies, Summary of Projected Supply and Unit Cost. One of them, the first one, is additional conservation in Dallas, and it's 38 cents per thousand gallons, or about $380 uh, dollars per million. Um, the most expensive is uh, some Lake Texacoma desalinization at $3.54 per thousand or about $3,500 per million. So, you know, you can see that Dallas has arrived at very similar conclusions that we have. You know, conservation is the, the lowest cost and it goes up from there. The table is extremely interesting, Paul, for you to look at. Uh, indirect reuse, uh, connect this lake, direct reuse, blah, 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 so forth and so on. And there's a full range of costs running from a factor of almost 10 in difference in cost. So, you know, I, I think we should look hard at what Dallas has done. Um, I think they're way ahead of us in this area. And one of the things they point up, which I find extremely interesting, is the impact of global warming on advanced or accelerated uh, evaporation from the lakes. They've taken a pretty good uh, reserve, like 15% for that. The second thing I find really interesting is Dallas is currently recycling 12.5% of their water. We're at something less than five. And Peacock Gap will help, but I think we really need to think about that area in especially the indirect reuse. And I know it's been thought through and the problem is infrastructure cost. Um, and then we've got you know the, the direct potential reuse coming in December of 23 with whatever hooks it will have. So anyway, I think we're on the right track here, but like I say, let's follow Cynthia's lead and look hard at what other folks have already done 
and make sure we're not out, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. And I'll send it over to you in a few minutes, Paul. Um, any other oh, public comment? There are none. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so uh, with that, I guess we can, uh, any, any other board comments on this issue? Okay, hearing none, let's uh, adjourn the meeting for today and uh, not adjourn the, the thought or the concept or the further discussion. And uh, let's, let's get this thing cooking. Happy long weekend, okay. everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you all. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.